I've directed prompt action to step up our Polaris submarine program. We'll build and place on station, at least nine months earlier than planned, substantially more units of a crucial deterrent, a fleet that will never attack first, but possess sufficient powers of retaliation concealed beneath the sea to discourage any aggressor from launching an attack upon our security. These scenes, filmed in 1962, are of the prelude to an historic weapon system test, Operation Dominic. The ballistic missile firing submarine USS Ethan Allen launched into the Pacific nuclear test range a fully armed Polaris A-1 missile. That shot, fired in 1962 from USS Ethan Allen, quite literally was heard round the world. For it fully demonstrated beyond any rational question the credibility of what President Kennedy called our crucial deterrent, the Fleet Ballistic Missile Weapon System. The object in the distance is a special antenna mast rigged to a fleet ballistic missile submarine which is about to perform another missile launch test. The year is 1972, and this ocean is the Atlantic, approximately 25 miles off the coast of Florida. The missile which will be launched within minutes is a Poseidon, the fourth generation in a series of missiles that since 1960 has solidly sustained the credibility and deterrent effectiveness of the Fleet Ballistic Missile Weapon System. 10, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. T-Zero. Fire. Roger, approaching ignition. aboard ship was just, just perfect, absolutely perfect. Rear Admiral Levering Smith is director of the Navy's Strategic Systems Project Office, the agency responsible for guiding development of the weapon system. Aboard USS James Madison, he commented on the longer range Poseidon and how its advancements impact on the system. As little different from Polaris as we could make it and still give it this flexibility. We made maximum use of uh, Polaris technology, the uh, industry practices at the time that this was, was started, and we made the minimum changes to the rest of the system. But all in all, it was making maximum use of what we had and designing it to do the job that had to be done and no more than that. The Polaris Poseidon submarines are large ships, approximately 400 feet long, 33 feet in diameter, and displacing nearly 8,000 tons. The interior spaces of the ships are divided roughly into three primary areas. After the engineering compartments, together with the nuclear reactor and the steam propulsion plant that can drive the sleek hull at surprising speed. Amidships, the 16 nuclear-tipped missiles, which are carried in these combination missile stowage and launching tubes. Forward are the crew living quarters and the operational nerve centers of the ship that are the heart of the weapon system. There are three decks, and in all this area, there is not one cubic foot of space that is not allocated to some essential activity. Looking at a breakdown of weapon system functions shows the reason. First, there is navigation. In order to strike a target thousands of miles away, 
you must first know the point of launch. In the navigation center is the most advanced equipment for maintaining a constant and precise report on the ship's position, even after weeks of submerged cruising. Fire control is the complex process of aiming any one or all 16 missiles, and on Poseidon, their separately targetable warheads against hundreds of possible targets throughout the world. Specially designed computers combine and process target location data and ship's position data to set up a separate flight path for each missile. In effect, these cramped compartments are the equivalent of a Kennedy Space Center blockhouse. The equipment is highly accurate and extremely fast. Uh, as weapons officer, I'm responsible to the commanding officer to see that the missiles are launched properly and on time. When the captain gives his permission to fire, it indicates a green light on the captain's permission to fire uh, light on the, our panel here. In terms of the overall system, the missiles are only one part or subsystem of the total weapon. Throughout their operational life, they are kept almost constantly in a readiness state. Also down here we have uh, two pieces of MITER equipment, uh, MITER 6 and the MITER 7. The MITER 7 is used to test the missile out in the tube itself. Actually makes the bird think it's flying in the tube. Activates the rotatable nozzles. The bird actually think it's flying. We test it out. We know it can fly when it leaves the tube. A complete pre-flight checkout of each missile, computer monitored, and also extremely fast. Missile firing orders can come only from the president and will be acted upon only after absolute confirmation. The command and control link to each Polaris Poseidon submarine is a worldwide communications network. To accomplish this, uh, we have two basic uh, means. Firstly, uh, there's two radio men on watch in the communication center at all time, guarding uh, pre-selected frequencies uh, in the event that we get a message at any time during the day. Secondly, the ship has four basic systems which allow us to, uh, to communicate uh, and receive radio communications while submerged. On patrol, the ships maintain strict radio silence, but always they are listening. Since the start of operations in 1960 and in the course of over 1,000 patrols carried out by the force, the system has proved again and again its ability to maintain command communications with the always submerged submarines. The concept of a missile launched from a submarine became a reality shortly after World War II. Regulus was the first practical outgrowth of the early development work. But the air-breathing missiles with their inherent limitations were merely a stopgap. The requirement for longer range, pinpoint accuracy, and greater payload capability inevitably singled out the ballistic missile. The early 1950s saw remarkable technological breakthroughs. Atomic propulsion for submarines became a reality in January of 1955, when USS Nautilus put to sea for the first time. And for longer range ballistic missiles, the application of solid fuel rocket motors became feasible with the development of high performance aluminized propellants and the reduction in size of nuclear warheads. The decision to go ahead with the program was made in December of 1956. By March of 1957, as the result of a breakthrough design of a powerful solid propellant rocket motor, the now familiar shape of the Polaris missile was established. Just one year later, the first launching from a submerged tactical launcher was performed with complete success. With the design of critical system components established, shipyards on both coasts were put to work building the submarines. Polaris flight tests advanced through a series of programs that started with flat pad launches.
Next, a ship launch tube simulator was used to eject the missile before motor ignition. Then, in a combined systems test, a specially outfitted merchantman, USS Observation Island, launched the Polaris missiles at sea. The first launch from a submarine occurred on 20 July 1960, just over four years after the program was authorized. The total success of this test ushered in a new era of deterrent strength for the United States. And proving that the shot was not just beginner's luck, a second fully successful flight was made less than three hours later. Ships and missiles were not all that was required for this innovative new weapon system. Men were needed, men by the thousands. To man the 41 submarines, each with two complete crews, 10,000 men would be needed. And there were requirements for the submarine tenders and shore support activities. Also, only the best men would do. All volunteers, ready and able to face the rigors of submarine duty. Special training complexes were built at New London, Connecticut, Charleston, South Carolina, Dam Neck, Virginia, and at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Issue style 45. Aye. Aye. Aye, next star will be 15. Aye. Stand by. Standing by. Give me a mark. Mark it. Got it. Concurrent with development and production of system hardware and training of the crews, logistics support facilities were made ready to handle deployment of the submarines. The first Polaris submarine to be deployed appropriately was USS George Washington. On 15 November 1960, she steamed seaward from Charleston Harbor. For two months, she remained on station, setting a record for submerged operation. 66 days, 10 hours. To keep the submarines close to their operating patrol areas, submarine tender anchorages and replenishment sites were established in the Holy Lock at Scotland, at Rota, Spain, and in the far Pacific at Guam. The use of tenders provides complete mobility for the squadron, eliminating the need for shore-based installations and minimizing dependence upon foreign countries. Well, our mission is to provide, on a continuing basis, ready FBM submarines to go out on Polaris deterrent patrols. We provide ready submarines to the unified commander, in this case, Sink Plant, to be available for whatever targeting he has assigned to these submarines. Proteus is more than just a supply ship. She is the focal point in the Pacific for all of our Polaris operations. I have my headquarters here. She's charged to repair and provision each one of these ships as they come in off patrol. She can do almost anything that's required to get these ships ready to go back to sea. For example, she can repair any piece of equipment on the ship, from the complex weapon systems to the navigation, communications, electronics, and all of the engineering aspects of each one of these submarines. Any job that needs to be accomplished on the ship can be either repaired aboard the submarine or taken up to the shops. The tender is the Thomas Jefferson's home for a third of the year. Uh, she knows our problems. We have worked with her people. Uh, we're familiar with them. 
uh, we may have problems when we leave on patrol that we leave with her uh, for solution when we get back. At this site, we have supported every class of missile and every class of Polaris submarine. In order to do this, I have a crew of approximately 1,100 men. We have no way of anticipating the problems that a submarine will bring us. As a result, our workshops have to be prepared on short notice to accomplish a variety of tasks which may range from the most complicated technical electronic repair in support of the navigation and fire control systems of the submarine through the demanding nuclear repair for its propulsion plant to some of the most basic skills known to man, such as foundry and heavy metal working. Despite the premium on space, every consideration is given to crew comfort on the FBM submarines. Classroom, theater, church, and common room are made of the multi-purpose mess hall. And the food is honestly deserving of the title, Best in the Navy. It's an open mess. Help yourself whenever you're hungry. Or help the cook if you've got a favorite recipe. Because of the good food, physical fitness is encouraged. Of course, popular team sports are a little difficult. In fact, with all this good living, weight watching takes real dedication. There are two full crews for each submarine. An operating cycle runs approximately three months. Following the patrol, there is a change of command. The crew coming off patrol returns to home port for 30 days of rest and recreation followed by a 60-day period of refresher training. Home port is exactly what the name implies. It's home for the men and their families. And it's complete with shopping and health facilities as well as schools, playgrounds, and social clubs. During refresher training, the men hone their skills. Exact duplicates of shipboard systems are set up in these laboratory classrooms. When they go to sea, their performance must be letter perfect. That's a key factor of total weapon system reliability. Upon returning to their ship, the crew will spend roughly a month preparing the sub and the new crewmen for the next patrol. With each cruise cycle, there is approximately a 25% crew replacement. But when they deploy to the patrol area, the men, the ship, and every element of the weapon system will be 100%. Throughout the entire period of their two months submerged operation, the reliability of the system and its readiness to fulfill its deterrent mission will be their responsibility. Operation of the weapon system on patrol is totally Navy, with no recourse to civilian support activities. The original Polaris, the A-1, now is retired from fleet use. Its early and successful development, however, put the weapon system on station a full three years ahead of even the most optimistic schedules. By mid-year 1962, it was being replaced by the 1,500-mile range Polaris A-2. Deployment of the Polaris A-3 in 1964 added a totally new dimension to the deterrent capability of the system. To explain what that means, for a given target, perhaps a thousand miles inland, submarines carrying the initial Polaris A-1 with a 1,200-mile range had less than 700,000 square miles of ocean in which to operate. Outfitted with either the 2,800-mile range Polaris A-3 or the Poseidon C-3 missile, that same ship has two to three million square miles of ocean in which to operate an increase in sea room that compounds enormously the anti-submarine warfare problems of detecting and tracking these submarines. November 1960 marked the deployment of the first fleet ballistic missile submarine. The deterrent strength of its 16 missiles equaled all the bombs dropped during World War II. In the years since, the strength of this crucial deterrent has grown to 41 submarines.
carrying 656 missiles. On 18 May 1972, the 1,000th Polaris Poseidon patrol was completed by USS John C. Calhoun, operating with Submarine Squadron 14 from Holylock, Scotland. 1,000 patrols, 1,000 examples of system efficiency, a continuing demonstration of system effectiveness and credibility. The reason we talk of credibility of the system is that the deterrence depends on the belief that the other fellow has that the system is going to work, that regardless of what he does, uh, it is capable of re retaliating, and if called on, will be completely reliable, and nothing that he can do will uh, really interfere with that retaliation so that uh, it's the demonstration of reliability as much as anything else that that credibility depends on and it's the credibility that makes the whole system believable to the other fellow. That in essence becomes what deterrence is. Now, That's I guess. what deterrence is and the foundation for it is that reliability the foundation for the reliability is the honesty with ourselves and with each other in the team devoted to this end product. The maintenance of a reliable, credible, and capable system is the first responsibility of our defense effort. And fundamental to this from its early beginning in 1956 has been the continued upgrading as a means of keeping this crucial deterrent viable. Toward continuing this policy in the future, President Nixon in January of 1972 directed the Defense Department to develop a program to build additional missile launching subs, carrying a new and far more effective missile. Commenting on the development of this new undersea deterrent called Trident is the program coordinator, Rear Admiral Robert Y. Kaufman, Director of Strategic Submarine Division. We've just seen a very brief overview of a most effective and really beautiful operating strategic deterrent. The Polaris Poseidon, we feel, is just about invulnerable today to any threat that might come along. And we also feel it will probably be fairly invulnerable for the immediate future years. However, with technology advancing as it is today, we must have some qualms about the ability of an existing system, which was really built with a lot of technology of the 50s, to maintain that state of survivability, high state of survivability, and invulnerability, which we need in this sea-based system. We are planning the Trident system to augment or to substitute for as necessary, the present system in the future years from the late 1970s on into the 21st century. The elements of the Trident system uh, will provide for increased area for the submarine to hide in, making it, we feel, uh, on a new plateau of invulnerability to any type of ASW, anti-submarine warfare counter, which an enemy might develop. We're going to do this through several means. First of all, of course, is the family of Trident missiles, which will give us roughly twice the performance of today's Poseidon submarines, or Poseidon missiles. And secondly, by improving the platform, the ship itself, by the time the first Trident submarine can come off the line, our present submarines will be at an advanced age, roughly 20 years for the oldest ones. And it would be very prudent to assume that they can't go on with trouble-free operation much beyond that point. Uh, however, we're trying very hard to prolong their lives beyond that point. The new submarine itself will be made quieter. It will have greater power to give it better mobility so that it can use the very great expanse of ocean 
made available to this submarine while targeting whatever enemy we may have. Coupled with the new missile and the new submarine will be a new system of maintenance featuring an integrated maintenance facility in which we'll have the missile handling and assembly facilities, ship repair facilities, personnel training facilities, and everything necessary to turn this submarine around in as brief a time as possible. And we really anticipate that this ship will be at sea approximately 20% more than the time we've enjoyed with our Polaris Poseidon system today. Whereas this is a costly system, we feel that it's cost effective in giving us great new dividends, if you will, in our life insurance policy for peace.